It's March 22nd, 2023. Welcome to the Path Podcast. My name is Tony. I'm here with Auk. How's it going, man? It's going It's going well, Tony. Thanks. And that's the Path Podcast. I kind of fumbled that. Uh, that's okay. We're, we're good to go. Door drains. <laughs> Door drains? Door drains. Like for your e-bike battery or something? No, in, in your in your automobile. Do you know that door drains exist? Do you hmm. even know what they are? I, I had no idea what they were until roughly today. I can kind of picture what they might be. Yeah. And so for the past, it's been raining a lot here in Southern California, which it normally doesn't do. And for, I'm going to say the past few weeks, I've been noticing that when I accelerate and when I put, put the brakes on in my truck, my truck's like 11 years old, that I hear water sloshing around. It's not in the car, but it sounds like it's coming from <laughs> inside the car, right? Wow. And um, I don't know. It's just really, it is kind of annoying. Every time you accelerate, every time you brake, you hear like this little sloshing. Yeah, disconcerting too. Right. And so finally today, I Googled it, a clogged door drain. Wow. So what do you do? I got one of the little, you know, little pick like you use in the shop. Okay. And um, I found the little door drain. It's literally two holes in the bottom of your door. Um, and cleaned out all the gunk in there and probably a quart of water poured out. Wow. I wonder if any of our listeners have been kind of wondering what's going on with their water sloshing in their <laughs> car doors. <laughs> Am I going crazy? <laughs> That's what I thought. I mean, I feel like there's water everywhere. I know. but <laughs> Anyways, I was kind of excited. It has nothing to do with bikes, but um, thought I'd share it. Yeah. Sweet. Thanks. I bet you there's a listener who needed that or maybe you know, someday I will. Yeah. So I, I thought the public service announcement. Welcome to my TED Talk. Nice. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. I feel like as far as news goes, the new SRAM transmission stuff dominates the news. Oh, my gosh. That's the truth all over, right? Yeah. I think with good reason. I think that it's a step forward in a lot of ways. What ways don't come to mind? <clears throat> From a rider experience perspective, I think th- that I believe the the pitch that SRAM is making, which is that you're going to be able to shift under load. Mm, right. So, and I mean, you're going to be able to shift under load with an e-bike without, with full disregard. That's, yeah. And just to rewind a minute, SRAM transmission also known as new axis basically yeah it's a new axis it takes advantage of their udh universal derailleur hanger right and i think that's an ingredient in what so it uses it sort of uses the udh in that's that you remove the udh right. and mount the derailleur directly to the frame that is that is right but it utilizes the mounting standard for yes. UDH. Yes, I like that. Thank you for the clarification. And I think that's one of kind of three ways where it essentially eliminates derailleur tuning. Yes. So if you come to the path, we have a, a an item in our point of sale system, a SKU, a part number or whatever. It wouldn't be a part number because it's for a labor code, but it's for tuned derailleur. Mm-hmm. And there's a description of what that includes. And that includes align your hanger right adjust your b tension yes adjust your cable tension yep and set your limit screws right or if it's an axs derailleur it would be all of those things and tune the mechanical trim or however you want to describe it correct on the axs there is no derailleur hanger right so the part that connects the derailleur to the bike is the derailleur and it's really robust and it's either broken or straight right i saw a picture of a guy almost standing i don't recommend this but standing on the derailleur right so strong i wonder if we're going to see broken frames instead of broken that's derailleurs and exactly what that's going to mean right i suspect that those dropouts are pretty well engineered to match the strength of the derailleur and that's part of the udh system is that they beat certain spec right 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 um, I don't know about strength spec, but thickness 
is going to be a part of that, I think. Right. And, um, so no derailleur hanger, no limit screws. Right. And like perfect alignment with the frame and the wh- and the wheel and the cassette, everything quote perfect. And that's what allows for these things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And no B adjust or no B adjust, no limit right. screws, and n- no derailleur hanger. So that's pretty much what we tune. To it almost gives me anxiety for job security, and then I remind myself all the other parts on the bike right. that we maintain and work on and fix. But I guess the the, the tuning is going to be that trim in and out. A little bit of like limit screw, electric limit screw setting. I don't know. That's not part of the setup instructions that I'm aware of. Interesting. Because it knows where it is on the bike. And the derailleur, I guess, kind of senses where it is on the cassette too. And if it's shifting. Hmm. And that's part of the shifting under load story. And then that goes to what I think is going to be the one kind of criticism from a rider perspective which is that it, in some cases it is going to shift slower mm. the reason it's going to shift slower is that instead of having a shift it, you, it's, it, it doesn't ever jam the chain over it waits for a shifting path that's right. mapped for it to be able to ride on two teeth at once securely Right. and in waiting for that sp- spot on the cassette there can be a delay in shifting. Right. I think the trade, I think for a lot of veteran riders, there's going to be an initial impression of, you know, we have the, we habitually don't shift under load. We have unconscious competence and not shifting under load. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. And so we're not going to enjoy as many of the benefits at first until we break the good slash now bad habit of not shifting under load. Right. And I, and then I think w- we will enjoy the benefits of getting, more shift of shifting more with more confidence and being in the optimal gear more often. Yeah. And I can imagine, um, under race conditions. Oh yeah. Right. And, um, yeah, always. Yeah. How many times have you broken a chain? (laughs) I think most riders are just going to experience less miss shifts over the course of their life with the equipment. Right and less time working on it. I couldn't believe how strong that system is that's attaching it to the bike. Yeah. Some other downsides, it is a full system. You have to buy the whole thing. So Mm -hmm. you have to buy cranks, cassette, chain, derailleur, shifter. The new shifter is retro compatible and vice versa. The old shifter works on the new system, but that's about it. It's called mountain flat. So, Transmission, a.k.a. new AXS, a.k.a. mountain flat top mm. or T-type. T-type. Lots of nomenclature <laughs> that you can it. use. Yeah, and that, I mean, I guess the flat top, uh, is that, what is that reference? The chain reference. is flat on the top. And I, 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 my understanding is that that allows for more side-to-side stiffness, which I think in this only shifting one cog at a time – on certain release points, I guess is a good. Mm, right. So, I I haven't ridden this. Have you had a chance to? Yeah, I rode legendary Lee Donovan's oh. bike around the parking lot. Nice. And I did my best to make it miss a shift, and I couldn't, including like nasty spinning, shifting under load, dragging the brake, both directions over up and down as fast as I could get it to go, all that. Right, right. And it, as rapidly as possible, shifts up one at a time. Yes, but it does, in some gears, Mm -hmm. it's almost a full crank rotation before it shifts. Oh, interesting. So there is, and and of course, too, that depends where you shift, Mm -hmm. because if you shift right before it gets to the gate or the, or the, yeah. So if you just miss that, I could see that in a very, um, in a, in a low gear, I think if you miss that gate and the cranks will rotate far before that cassette comes back around to its. Yeah. Wow. I I don't know. I think you're going to make that up in the power though. I think that veteran riders are going to jump on it and feel the delay and 
not intuitively appreciate the ability to shift under load because we don't know we want it because we've been so ingrained not to do it. I want it. <laughs> right. <laughs> Maybe I'm not veteran enough. <laughs> yeah. I, I just, I picture people not really seeing the benefit in a test ride sometimes mm. and seeing that I feel like in a parking lot test ride, that delay might jump out at you more than the benefit also because you're comparing it to other parking lot test rides that are all hopefully perfectly tuned so it's not as big of a difference you're not parking lot. yeah, yeah exactly. so you're not getting that need to sh- you're not getting to shift it under load real load right and see that magic and y- yeah you're you're you expect that new bike in the parking lot to shift really really well right right so wow um a little bit lower profile. The derailleur uh, sits closer to the center line of the bike. Yeah, like f- le- sticks out less. Right. That should and help. a little forward as well. Oh, both I think should help. Kind of an interesting technical curveball is that it's designed around a fifty-five chain line mm. uh, for about seven, six, six millimeters further out than kind of standard boosts. Um, dub, you know, right. 12 speed Eagle recommended chain lines. It's interesting because, you know, the cassette hasn't really moved. Mm-hmm. So you, traditionally, right, the chain line, one way to think of an optimized chain line is where the chain is really, really straight, either from the middle of the cassette or from whatever gear you want it most optimized for. And to move the f- chain ring way out away from the center of the bike and not move the cassettes kind of interesting. And they talked about how the jockeys kind of angled out oh. to like aim at the, the outboard chain line. Right. And as part of all that, there's this added thing they claim is that you can backpedal in the big cog, which you can't do. In cur- I mean, if you backpedal in the big cog and current Eagle, um, it, the chain comes good. Right off, right. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's, uh, so that, that it is further out. The chain ring is further the out. Chain ring is further out by about six, seven millimeters. And the, um, the kit right. comes with some spacers to make your crank, get the right chain line. Oh, interesting. On, on the cranks that are meant to get the right chain line because they come with the kit. Right. So there's is a lot it of the kit that makes the crank the right crank or is it something I think you have to have a long enough spindle to run the spacer. Mm, right, 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 right. And it there's there's already debate like oh is it going to work on this chainring SRAM like wolf tooth is it going to work on a wolf tooth chainring? Right. Wolf tooth came out today they said yes, which we speculated because wolf tooth um, road stuff works with the road T type flat top chains mm, got it. and, and with a regular 12 speed SRAM chain. So SRAM says no wolf tooth says yes, probably works pretty okay as my guess. Right. But then there's all the, there, it'll be interesting to see how the whole, this whole transmission, system, transmission system plays with a narrower chain line. If you say don't, get new cranks right right that's interesting so it's going to sit one gear taller on the cassette one cassette tooth out on a perfect chain line is that what it's saying oh i think more than that i think there's seven millimeters i think there's more less than seven millimeters between cogs Mm. yeah one or two two maybe it's interesting and and what does that mean when you're in the lowest gear and the chain is all the way in in the on the cassette and it's a little further out on the ring? In be interesting That's to like see further. Hmm. But to your earlier comment about the jockey, the pulleys, they're angled. If you can pedal backwards in that gear, that sort of helps me believe that it's not that bad. Right. That's impressive. Yeah. That's one of those FAQ type things. I remember throughout Eagle 
especially early on, a lot of customers would upgrade to it and they'd come back and be like, you guys installed this wrong, check it out. And they'd put it in the granite gear and pedal backwards. Right. And the chain would derail onto a smaller cog and we'd be like, uh, yeah, that, uh, it does that. It does that. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, some other noteworthy things, chain length is, a, you, you pick your, your chain length affects B, F, B gap. Mm-hmm. Chain length is measured in the app, in the AXS app. So you tell the AXS app which bike you have. If it has flip chip or anything, you tell it what position you're running it in, and it tells you a chain length to run in links. Wow. Yeah. And if on the chain box, when you buy a chain aftermarket, it show, there's a little printed li- chain links that show, that show you how many you can remove for a different lengths mm. so that you, can, you don't have to count all the links. Right. But – they did warn us to watch out for a curveball where some OE chains aren't cut to full length. So if you're building a bike out of the box, don't just start taking links. <laughs> make sure it's full length before you use that technique to, right, to right. It's pretty exciting though. I mean, I think with how much less it's going to miss shifts and how much less tuning it's going to take and the ability to shift under load. I think those things combined are going to be the reasons why everything else seems kind of clunky and old pretty soon. Maybe. Yeah. If it's if it's as good as SRAM says it is, and I kind of believe it. With as long as UDH standard has been out, they've been th- they've been working on this for a while. This is the long game for sure. Yeah, and I wonder if they had this prototypes when UDH even before UDH came out. Yeah, a couple of other points of note: there is one way to get the kit without cranks. And that okay. is by ordering the e-bike chainring only kit, and it comes with a four four bolt one hundred four four bolt one hundred four e-bike chainring. Mm-hmm. Saves you a hundred bucks compared to the XO one kit with the mm. cranks. Right, they're right. aluminum. Right. The XO one crank kit comes with aluminum cranks. The X X kit comes with foam core carbon cranks. Got it. And the XX one SL kit comes with hollow carbon cranks. Oh, hold on. The XX1 SL kit also comes with, I believe it's three aluminum cogs on the cassette and therefore is not e-bike recommended. Got it. And and more or less, Mm. from big picture, those are the differences between the kits is the SL kit's lighter cassette. There's differences on the cranks. Yep. And the shifting under load, maybe you want to pay a little more attention to the don't run this thing. Don't run the XXSL cassette on an e-bike because the shifting under load, or maybe not. Does it make a difference? I think it's more just the torque and and, and um, durate, the, you know, hot miles that you put on yeah. it is my guess. Right. I think it can take. To a certain extent, I see why. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. I think it can take the the shifting under load probably. And it's designed to shift smoothly under load, so it's not like an extra clank. Yeah. And to that point, you know, Current Eagle has a very positive feel to the point of kind of almost slams into gear, which Mm. some people would describe that as the opposite of smooth. Mm. This is a much smoother experience. Oh. Much smoother shifting experience. Right, right, right. And not quite as responsive. when you don't have to worry about shifting under power like right your the urgency of the shift might be a slightly uh, that sense of needing it to shift right when you want it to might come partly from this ingrained sense that you need to get into gear real quick before the steep part right and knowing you can even just that slight ease on the pedals to you know ease on the pedals to do the shift and then back onto the power, not having that and just shifting through the urgency, like you say, the continuous power. I hadn't really quite thought of it that way, but I think that's a really good point. I do think that because you can just keep the power on, it is going to be less annoying that it shifts a little slower once you're used to that. I I think it's going to be, that's why I'm like, I want this. It's for me, Again, like on those, when you're really pushing it on an uphill 
and you need to shift, you're like, oh my gosh, that even mentally for me, that little ease and back on. I suspect it's going to be difficult for me to teach, to ref, teach to reflex right. shifting under load. Mm. But who knows? It might be so useful that your body adapts quickly. You know, your, your reflexes adapt quickly. I'm ready quickly. to start adapting right now. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. You ready? You ready? 1600 bucks? Exactly. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. Oh, and two, are you ready to run slightly longer cranks than you want to in order yeah, to do it? Or, or not run the one? <laughs> so that gets device. us back to the 55 chain line. Mm. So... Right now, I believe for those XO kits, the shortest cranks are, are 165. They, I, I think so, right? Which is five millimeters longer than I really want to run right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I want to be moving towards 155s, not towards 165s. Why is that the shortest length right now? I don't know. Mm. I mean, I guess my answer would be that SRAM doesn't believe that cranks are getting shorter the way I do. Mm. I mean, I guess on the e-bike, you get the e-bike only kit. And, and those go down to 160, mm. which still isn't super short for e-bike. Right. That's what it's I'm It's kind of like stock e-bike right now. Yeah, yeah. That's in an I'm environment really where every year they seem shorter. Yep. Yeah. You know, o over the years, there's been that item that gets swapped out on every new bike. And we're in an era right now where there's not a lot of those items. The bikes come spec really well. Right. But it does feel like more and more that might be the thing that all the brands that aren't really on point with spec might be specking too long at cranks. Right, right. And it's becoming a way for, I think, too, it's becoming a way for the really kind of connected and, you know, in-touch brands to kind of shred signal that they're connected and in-touch mm. by specking shorter cranks than the competition. And Giant did that this year. Transition did that this year. What are what are giant are giants one sixty? The stock cranks on our rain E's are one sixty. Yeah, that's which right. is to me safely shorter than the competition. <laughs> yes, that's true. Yeah, I was wondering if any of the yeah if any of their even newer bikes were going to come out with one fifty fives. I bet maybe in a year or two. Yeah, yeah. So. um I guess the thing with the uh, uh, transmission, that UDH standard. So that's another, your frame has to have the UDH. 100%, no other way to do it. Yep. So if you don't have that, you, and even if you wanted to spend 1600 bucks. A lot of frames have it. A lot of frames have Especially, it. Especially, you know, 2020 and newer. Right, right. So, you know, some Orbez, all Santa Cruz, um, most of the brands we sell transition. have at least some transition. Absolutely. Most of the brands we sell have at least some of their models are now U, like their newer models are UDH. Fantastic. Yeah. Man, that is, that's big news. And I, I think because, because of the launch of transmission, a lot of our bike brands announced new products yesterday too. Mm, like, like that Trans Elite and Intrigue Elite. <laughs> yeah, that are sitting just off camera. We've been hinting at those for a while. Yeah. And it really is a new blend of categories. Yeah. So you want to walk through some of the some of the details on that? Well, let's start with the big picture because I think the headline yeah, is... You're right. The headline is full power, small battery, lightweight. Mm -hmm. So it has kind of more or less the weight and and kinematics of say like a rise or a shuttle SL or that style of bike. Right. But full 80 Newton meters of torque, you know, full, full power e-bike torque on right. the full Yamaha motor, the same as the range that we have. But the Yamaha mo motor has been uh, redesigned a little bit. It's a little bit slimmer. Is that right? I think maybe, or at least that's what's maybe a little, but it's still the same power. Still the same, which is amazing. In a slightly slimmer, smaller package, you get the same full power. Uh, battery tech is is evolving, so get a maybe a a four. What is it? Four hundred or six hundred uh, watt battery? It's a four hundred watt hour battery, and for five hundred bucks, you can get a two hundred watt hour range extender mm. that pretty much looks like a water bottle. Wow. Maybe it's five hundred bucks. I think it's about five hundred right, bucks. Right, right. And 
to me, that's a kind of a smart way to do it because you get the th- maybe 44 ish pound bike yep. for your regular hour, hour and a half park rides. Yep. And add a couple pounds, get it up to 46, and then you have 600 watt hours yep. for your longer rides. And if you want to do some really long rides, you can get two range extenders. Yeah, and, and with the size of the ba- the range extenders coming down, yeah. and battery tech. And, everything, and they don't look as weird. Right. You can, um, that's definitely manageable. You don't need to have a custom designed backpack to hold that right. monster of a battery anymore. Right, and it's just a couple pounds, I think. Right, right. Yeah. So then, so like you're saying, the bigger picture is it's, yeah, straddling, it is playing well in that light e-bike space. And I rode it at one of our local trails and it's playful and poppy and you can wheelie it and manual it and bunny hop it Mm. like more like a rise. Yeah. Less, less like a rise shuttle SL. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's slightly heavy for the category. Right. Not real heavy for the category but full power yeah and mixed wheel size out of the box all the time that's fantastic lots of price points yep all of them good values six thousand to fourteen thousand the eye popping fourteen thousand yeah but uh starting at six all the way up to fourteen bet that fourteen thousand dollar one's under 40 pounds maybe i'd be curious to know that's true i don't know I have mixed feelings about the flight attendant that some of them come with, but a lot of them didn't all come with flight attendant. And it might be good on that bike. I don't know. I think it's good for lots of riders for sure. Mm, yeah. I, I like my flight attendant. Uh, headset routed, cable routing. Yep. Which pretty pretty polarizing to route the head, you know, the headset routed, cable routing, but I also think it's just the way now. It's, Yeah. I, you know, when we were all running sta- straight one and one eighth steerer tubes, tapered tapered steerer tubes were polarizing. Mm. Now a one and one eighth steerer tube would be worse than polarizing. <laughs> right. And I, this may not be a perfect analogy or a perfect comparison, but I like not having holes in the frame. Yeah. I think it looks cleaner, and I th- I believe th- that it gives the engineers better options in frame design. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it, go ahead. So, I mean, for sure, it's, you, you know, you have to pull your headset apart if you want to. You, you have to deal with your rear brake line and stuff. And, and it's complicated if you want to change your headset bearing. It's complicated if you want to do certain things. It adds some complication. For a bike shop mechanic, I can understand. I can see how that you're going to be doing that multiple times and in you know again that's a an efficiency thing for the uh home mechanic you may never only if you change your rear brake yeah and the times when you're gonna have to for changing your upper headset bearings of not a common event that's right changing your lower headset bearing is many times more common correct and there's some other situa- situations where it could add some compl- complexity in addition to just the build. Mm. There's also, you know, SRAM's new brakes, ang- the, yeah. the, the line comes out at a different angle to optimize yeah. for that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we did see that some brake lines seemed like they were getting stressed out from not being in a perfect, in, right in a great angle. And yeah. maybe this will help with that. Maybe it won't. So it's not all good. Right. And I think a big downside is, as of now, there's not a lot of headset availability yet. Mm, Right. But that's not the standard's fault, and that'll sort itself out. Right. Right. Do you know if they have that lower uh, one and a half inch? No. The lower, uh, uh, not one and a half inch. The larger diameter, lower steer. (laughs) Oh. I bet it does. Uh, you know what? I bet it doesn't because they're trying to keep the weight. I don't know. Good question. Mm. I, I almost want to go over there and look. <laughs> um, how about geometry? To claim 65.8 head angle. I measured it at 65. It feels more 65 ish yeah, to me. Could be. Uh, I do think I'd put an angle set on it and try to get it slacker than 65. It yeah. does have cups in it, so I think potentially that's doable. 
Did you turn the bike 180 degrees? I did. So I was talking about the fact that no floor is really level. And if you measure the head angle and then flip the bike 180 degrees and measure it again and take the average of the two, it, it evens out for any sort of imp- lack of level floor. But Especially if you do this in your garage. Yeah, or at a bike, <laughs> at a bike shop in an old building with mm, kind of yeah. chunky concrete slab yeah. floor. So, oh, 60, yeah, um, I'd be interested to see the, uh, like the bottom bracket height because I know on the, uh, on the rain ease, the bottom bracket height is lower than advertised, which I actually love the fact that it's lower than advertised. This has been a long standing trend is we've, you, you notice that bikes are lower than advertised <laughs> and, and appreciate it. <laughs> I feel like other bikes are the other way around, and that's unfortunate. Yeah. I also just a lot of it is just what rims and tires did you measure it with, maybe? Yeah. But like even like the stock when you get it and it you know Oh yeah. So uh Santa Cruz used to be like that as well. I do think we used to speculate that people were were concerned that they would scare customers off mm, by right. publishing too low of a bottom bracket, mm-hmm. but that people would like how it rides regardless. Right. Which might be true. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, these cranks are sh- striking the rocks too many times. Yeah. <laughs> so I did take the Rain Elite out for a ride at one of our local trails, uh-huh. and I pretty much I used up all, all almost the whole battery in like just under an hour and a half full boost the whole time all right how um how much vert how much climbing do you remember hour Mm, and a half is not not no it was a cruisy hour and a half i'm i would speculate not much over 2000 Mm -hmm. even a little over 2000 but some miles too yeah so i was i i I traversed some flat at full boost right too for a while so but I wonder if you if you did that in like trail mode or whatever you know. Is, are there five levels? Yeah, I would speculate levels? that so if you, did if you like s- three you, in about an hour and a half, you get still have way more battery left. I speculate that if you would stay in that sixty newton meter and less range, you would get rain, rise like range. Mm, right. But why? <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> well. I kind of am trying to see how you, how this bike solves a lot of problems by you can you can ride with your friends that have those style of bikes mm. stay in their range and stay in their zone and get the same range as them you yep. put the range extender on go ride with your friends that have full power d bikes yeah stay in their speed zone and get a similar range to them yeah. and have kind of the more bikey feel the whole time right because it is like uh that that range extender probably weighs as much as a water bottle with water in it I think probably twice as much, mm-hmm. give or take. Okay. I think two pounds is probably a low estimate, and mm-hmm. a sixteen ounce water bottle is right. one pound. Twenty two ounce water bottle, maybe. How much? Tw- how, much how many ounces? Uh, sixteen. Yeah, I guess so. You're I right. think most You're of right. our water bottles bottles yeah. are either sixteen You're or right. twenty two. Yeah. Man, those look exciting. Same. Yeah, I, I'm interested to see how people respond to them. I think that it's a really cool take on what an e-bike should be. I agree, too. And the aesthetics of it. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Top tube straight down into the chain, into the dropouts, pretty much. And the, again, battery tech, what it is, it's really hard to tell that's an e-bike. Yes, especially compared to anything with 80 newton meters. Right. But even like compared to an Orbea Rise, I think the only bike in the shop that is more sneaky about being an e-bike is the Shuttle SL. Mm, right. I think part of it is the way that they redesigned that the motor. They they shrank the motor, kept it at eighty five newton meters. Yeah, and, and how and, and how giant rotated the motor up mm, into the right. And again, the battery tech. This is one of the first ones taking advantage of the new batteries, I think. So, yeah, I, yeah, I would, I have been having trouble tracking what they're talking about, but yes, how many cells is, is that <laughs> right, thing? right? Um, yeah, I, I mean, again, I don't know all the technical side of it. I just in reading a couple art different articles on on rechargeable battery technology, um, s- smaller and lighter, or 
more power in the same package. Right. Is is the whole where it's moving. So Right. I think the rise is a good point of reference where the twenty twenty three rise you can get basically you can get an additional almost two hundred watt hours at the same weight. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or you can get the old three forty or whatever it is. Right. At lighter. At two pounds lighter. Yeah. Is what they're claiming. I don't Yeah. Who knows? Until you weigh it. Yeah, this is uh you guys still have that demo around? No. <laughs> but I think it I think the question uh, I think it's a good question to ask is is the way to do it to start with a smaller battery all the time and do range extenders? Mm. That way you don't have the big honking down tube. Right. You get a lighter weight for the time when you don't need the range. Right. And then you add the range as needed. To I think that might make sense. I think that might be the kind of maybe where the cards land even more and more. I find my ride experience mapping onto that. Yeah, and really like you know, like on the wild, for example, you can get the six hundred watt hour battery mm-hmm. or you can get the seven twenty, I think it is. Right. And there's a somewhat significant weight difference. Right. And a little bit of a price difference that you could put towards that range extender. Right. I don't know. It's interesting. I don't know which, if I was ordering one right now and I could get either one of those wilds, I'm not sure which battery size I would get. Man. Would I get the big battery and pretty much n- almost never need a range extender or would I get the smaller battery and a range extender? Because if you put a range extender on that smaller battery, now you're like 800 and that's a really, that's a long ride. Yeah. So, yeah. It's a lot of boost. That's a lot of boost. I I know for myself, a lot of my rides, um, yeah, with the with the full-size battery, that's 600. I think it's a 600-watt-hour battery on the, on the Rain E. Um, I don't, I don't use the whole thing. So. It's pretty rare that I use the whole thing. Yeah, so. That's why I, I like this concept of a smaller battery with a range extender. Yeah. Right. But full power. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't have to use it all the time. Right. Yeah, and um, I've been riding the, the Rain E, not, not lately because it's been raining so much, but I've been riding that Rain E thinking about these lighter – the lighter e-bike class. Yeah. yeah. Like you need both. Yeah. Could, or would you ditch the rainy and just get a lighter e-bike? I could see um I could see space for both in my life. Yeah. This is what I've been thinking is if pre-e-bike you were the kind of person who needed more than one like a qu- if you were a quiver person pre-e-bike, <laughs> you're going to be an e-bike would, quiver person now. Yeah. Yeah. And the new bikes that are coming out allow that provide that experience. Right. There's enough differentiation now yeah. between, say, a Trans Elite and a Rain E. Yeah. I mean, maybe the Rain E ends up with um, with a, a dual crown fork on it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, you see Over the Hump got rescheduled from Rain. I did. April 8th. Registration so, is open now. Yeah, that's... Um, Man, I cannot believe how much rain there's been. Uh, and uh, was it our last? Was it our last podcast that we were talking about? Um, even with the the parks are opening up, but there's been so much rain that it almost feels like they need an extra day. Uh, and I know there's a pressure both ways, you know, to open the open the, up the the parks and the trails, and at the same time protect the the trails. But, uh, yeah. And you know, just because an area is open, doesn't mean it's a good idea to use it for all uses all the time. That is, that is I mean, you true. can go just for example, it's been raining a lot. I don't think our beaches are closed. Right. I wouldn't go swimming in the ocean at <laughs> Newport. <laughs> right. There's a lot of urban runoff in that water right now. And it's pretty gross. <laughs> I mean, maybe all the grossness is washed out and washed through maybe. 
Ah, uh, gosh. <laughs> yeah, but then you get the part where people's septic tape tanks start to overflow. Yeah, really and gosh, right, right. Yeah, I wouldn't personally. Yeah, no, I, I'm not. Although going to the coastal areas and running by the beach is wonderful. Is wonderful. Yeah. So point being, there's. L- I would like to think that we could all live in a world where there's lots of stuff that we all choose not to do that we would be allowed to do. That is true. <laughs> that never happened, but yeah, it's true. <laughs> well, there's still a lot of stuff that people choose not to do that they're okay. allowed to do. There's still That's a little true. room. That's true. <laughs> uh, Women's Wednesday is back. Fun thing with that is we're having different industry sponsors for each one. Oh, great. For example, April 12th, Giant and Live are the Live is the sponsor, Ooh, and there's and it's also a demo day. It's a Live demo day as well. So that should be fun. Yeah, that should be extremely fun. Yeah. And related to that, have we talked about on the podcast that our demo program is back? I think we might have mentioned that we had a one bike demo program that was back. It's more than that now. It's more. So we have medium, large, and extra large shuttle SL demo bikes. Oh, my gosh. We have medium and large shuttle LT demo bikes. We have a medium pivot switchblade. A small pivot shadow cat. Whoa. We have an extra large rain two. Oh gosh. And we have a large Kona process one thirty four. Oh nice. You can book them online on our website. And all the demo fees are one hundred percent a credit in our store towards the purchase of any bike for six months. That's fantastic. Can you do that? What if you demoed like 10 bikes the only limitation on using demo fees as credits in our store towards a bike purchase is six months six months so actually this came up in the planning of could someone game this and kind of like demo bikes for a period of time and then kind of ride for free for a few months and then have a free bike or no no Ride demo bikes for a few months and then have a free bike. It's not a free bike. They paid a lot of money in demo <laughs> fees for a few months. What we decided like is we would see payment how, plan. how much work that really ended up being for us and decide if it was worth it if anyone All right, tried if that. anyone does that. <laughs> so the fees are not real cheap. They're meant to be kind of re- help the bike stay here for people who actually want to try them and who are willing to pay a little more because they are planning to get their demo fee back. Right, right. So... I, I want to say it's you know over two hundred bucks for some of the e bikes and some of the more expensive bikes. It's not cheap, and that's not out, that's not unreasonable. Thank you. Glad you think so. <laughs> I mean, really, you go to like Mammoth or some of these places and the bike rentals. I was like, are you kidding me? And I'm like, okay, well, I mean, yeah, that's uh, an all day rental, and it's check it out in the morning, return it at, in the afternoon. Okay. So how much is that? I think I've seen them like 150. Okay, so this is, and you can and that doesn't go towards a purchase of anything. No, no. So this is pick it up one day and return it the next. See, that's fantastic. The way the bookings work, like, could you pick it up at 10 o'clock in the morning and return it at five the next day? I think we require that you return it by four the next day. By four, okay. Uh, but other than that, pretty much, yeah. That's super generous. Allows a, a couple days of riding potentially if you yeah. plan it well. Uh, the way our booking program works, we have a minimum lead time of three days to book the demo. Mm, okay. So if you were to log on there now, it wouldn't, it, it, the soonest yeah. one day you could book a demo is three days from now. Mm, got it. Got it. If you find yourself in a position where you want to book a demo sooner than that, contact us, get, get clearance from us either on a text message or on the phone that we have the bike here it can have it ready w- within your time frame mm-hmm. and then we will ask you to book it for the first available date and change the, the reservation day on our on, on our end oh, got it. so long story short in some cases we can do shorter than three day lead times but that's on a case-by-case basis and you have to contact us got it i like if that. you can plan it more than three days in advance you can just do it from your computer you can yeah so uh, this is a great program, and uh, kudos to Pivot for getting a whole slew of demo bikes to you, uh, and to Kona 
and and uh, who was the last? Kona, yeah, Kona, Pivot, and Giant. Giant. Thanks to Giant, of course. And we will continue to add bikes to the program. It, it's uh, people enjoy demoing bikes. Yeah, yeah, it's a good experience, and it's one of those things where back when we, we we had suspended our demo program due to the pandemic and now we're bringing it back but before the pandemic a lot of our customers would come in and they would say i they'd say here's three bikes that i i'm interested in. like i've narrowed my my list down to three and then they would say i can demo these two so this one's off the list that i can't demo mm. like they were that committed to demoing wow. a bike before they right. tried it and i think it makes sense it's once you buy a few bikes by demoing them in dirt first, it's a much different experience than right. kind of trying to pick the right bike from parking lot test right. rides. Right, right. I just looked at a um, a shop up in Mammoth Lakes. Uh, it's forty bucks an hour for their p- premium trail bike. Forty bucks an hour, eighty bucks for four hours, or one hundred and twenty for a full day. Okay. So, uh, two hundred for the overnight. It's over two hundred. For a top shelf you bike, I, but I still think that's worth it. <laughs> right. It's like two days. Yeah. You get two days of riding out of it. The main point is it's for serious buyers who think they yeah. probably want to work with the path. Yeah. And at that point, it'll, the program really makes sense. For everyone else, it's a lot of work for us to, because we're not just trying to create a demo experience. We're trying to keep these bikes like. That's very true. A, a really strong representation of how the bike rides and set the suspension up for each rider. Yeah. And we put a lot into, you know, some riders ask us to do thing, to do more than, you know, we sometimes go pretty far to get the bike <laughs> set up for the rider. So. Bike set up tails from the crypt. <laughs> <laughs> In some cases, we have put many hours into bike prep for one rider just to get the bike set up the way they needed mm. to be to enjoy the experience. Right, right. right. Well, Some people have more needs than others. Right, right. Uh, it applies in every aspect of life. Yeah. <clears throat> so that is fantastic. Uh, demo demo programs back. Um, got some good good cool bikes there. Uh, rides are coming. Rides are back. Although with all this wet weather, it'll be. Might be uh, check the website because it might be a little bit before we get back out on. The yeah, trails. and we don't really let the demos go out when the trails are closed. Mm, right, 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 right. No, that's that's cool. So, um, I don't know. You can probably see behind us here. Maybe there's a transition spur that's sitting there because I was checking it out before the show. <laughs> it, it's a medium, I think. It's kind of like my size, five point three pounds. What? With with axle seat yeah. collar, Shock. and also I said axle bolt. I want to just pick at something a little bit. Yeah, you ever hear people call that an axle? Mm. Yeah, it's not an axle. It's an axle bolt. <laughs> it. I mean, this is sort of picking on it, but if that's an axle, what is the thing in your hub that the bearings turn on called? Mm. I don't know. An axle. I mean, that's an axle. Yeah. That's I think. Axle. Yeah. I think so, too. Anyway, I like to refer to those as axle bolts. 5.3 pounds. Yeah. I, I have that exact. With frame. a rear shock axle bolt and seat collar. Yeah, that's why you can build those up really light. Sub 26 pounds. Makes me want to build a down country bike. And there's some good options to build a down country bike. You have one. Kind of. I mean, it needs to go on a diet. My current down country yeah, bike weighs 30 to, pounds. It needs to go on a diet. But I think my down country <laughs> bike is actually more a short travel trail bike is how it turned out. Mm, yeah. 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 I think mine is mine is uh, right around 27. And I think baby down country is the one spot where I run the big rear wheel for like mm, true down yeah, country. Yeah. Dual 29. I could see that. I could see that. Maybe the one bike with no Kush core? I don't know. Kush core with XC tires. Or maybe XC Kush core with XC tires, yeah. Yeah. I think that's actually I've been I haven't had a chance to ride my setup, but that's I that's how my that's how my down country bike is set up. It's the trans S E. And also on a bike on that bike I would run narrow enough tires to really make the X E Kush core make sense. Mm. Because I think that's part of the story, right? If you w- want to run a 2.5, mm-hmm. the XE Kush Core doesn't take up enough of the volume, right. I don't think. I think 2.4 is about as big as you can get. That's what they recommend. Yeah, so I'm running the 2.4. Uh, 
uh, XC tires. I haven't ridden it enough to to really, I think, sing the praises of Kushkor. <laughs> <laughs> Of XC Kushkor. Of XC Kushkor, right, right. I did put, um, I mean, we probably talked about this. I did put uh, Kushkor in my in my uh, gravel bike. I have gravel, I have CX uh, Kushkor. Uh, and I think that's up to 50 millimeter tires. So, and that is a difference. That makes a big difference. Yeah, that is awesome. Anyways. Yeah, no, oh, cool. I was reading an article, and I, I I need to do a little more reading on this. Has Kishcorp has have tire inserts past their prime? What? Yeah, that's what this this, this is saying. Oh, sounds like a grabby headline. What? Yeah, I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Still wear pleated pants, but no, I mean Kishcorp isn't <laughs> isn't past its prime. <laughs> and Kishcorp is not a pop star it's not. either. Yeah. Not pleated pants either. I mean, geez. <laughs> um, and these days, it's not woke to think a pop star's past its prime. Or uh, their, 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 their prime. <laughs> their prime. Um, so, let's see. What else is going on? Bike sale 2023 rages on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Jeez. So, you know, Santa Cruz started their factory sale. Yep. And... We've been talking a lot on the podcast about the liquidation cycle of 2022 bikes and how the path was overstocked on them and then how we moved through some of that stock and yep. then how we now restocked on some of them yep. to help some of our brands move them mm -hmm. and how we have all these great <clears throat> deals in the store. And that's cool. Special or Santa Cruz recently announces their factory sale that includes 2023 bikes that have just barely come oh out my right gosh, like what? barely brand new colors yeah. brand new specs and before the transmission announcement i didn't really quite track what was going on but mm -hmm. now i think i understand what's going on i think that and, and i've kind of been feeling out some other vendors and i think that generally what's going on is everyone had way too much 2022 mm -hmm. a lot of people's 2023 is pretty much the 2022 in different colors got it so they essentially also have too much 2023. Mm. But, and, or, because they had too much 2022, a lot of people didn't order a lot, bring in a lot of 2023 or buy yep. a lot of 2023 from the factories. So it's, it now it's becoming pretty clear that the Santa Cruz factory sale is probably going to be, maybe not the new pricing, but maybe not. Uh, I don't think they're ever going back to the old pricing. Right. And it remains to see what the new pricing looks like after the sale, but I suspect it's closer to the sale pricing than to the old pricing, oh, even for the 2023 bikes, right? except for the ones that come with transmission, and those are 2024 colors. God. In March of 2023, we're getting these 2024 colors, Got and it. 2023 bikes are essentially on sale and staying on sale till they're gone. Oof. Right. So I think, you know, Santa Cruz is kind of a leader. Sometimes mm -hmm. they're the first to move on new product ideas, right. say mixed wheel size. Uh, I think they're, I think this is, I'm, I mm. might be reading too much into this, but I sort of think this is what's going on in the industry now. Right. Is that what we're going to see is even the 2023s are now part of the liquidation cycle. Right. And everyone's trying to get as early as a start as we can on 2024. Right. With the hopes of maybe 2024 coming back to like a to, to quote new normal of of retail, like where you're not to the point where our 2024 inventory as an industry is right sized for demand. Correct. Correct. We'll see. Yeah. Crazy yeah. times, but yeah. almost every bike in the store right now is 20 to 30 percent off. It seems like, except for the like handful that are 2024 colors or just came out or have transmission on them or or these transex advanced e plus elites because they just came out they <laughs> fall into that right. just came out category yeah um all, almost like maybe a 2023 and a half mm, right are you seeing this phenomenon in like soft goods clothing and helmets and less so 
But yes, I mean, you might notice that we have some Patagonia on sale right now. Oh, right. And that's getting snatched up on our web store because Patagonia is not usually on sale. Correct. And, you know, usually by the time they do put it on sale, we've sold it all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this time we ordered like COVID level numbers, so we still have some. Mm, Right, right. Um, A lot of times they don't even need to put it on sale because they sell it all too. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, yeah, I think it is happening with soft goods. I don't – the – the the out the demand outpacing supply was definitely most centered on bikes and now the supply outpacing demand is also most centered on bikes which makes sense yeah yeah and that's um i keep telling my friends if you need a bike now's a good time to (laughs) it's funny yeah and it's it's funny too. There's there are a few people who would come in through through the last few years and just look at all the bikes and be like, you know, I usually buy a new bike every year or two, but I'm just gonna wait. And a few of them have come in. It's like paid off. I waited, and now I'm buying one. <laughs> it's like good job. I'm kind of glad you waited because I need to sell one today too. <laughs> oh, so so I read an article a long. <laughs> <laughs> that that uh, semi under the breath comment. Um, what percentage of COVID riders have stuck with riding? I read this article in Brain, and it ranged from none to oh, a hundred percent of them have stayed. Right. I think in the last few rainy months in SoCal, no one's riding, mm-hmm. and I think. Um, we are really going to get a, 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 f- a sense for it when the sun comes out this spring. Mm-hmm. We're going to really find out what a new normal looks like. Right. Because I think when there's a really big shift, there's sometimes kind of just a, a doldrums. And I think mm-hmm. for our industry, that was this last fall. Right. And then there's a shift to the new cycle. And it's funny, like... I remember I have been having a lot of feelings that remind me of 2008 and mm. last fall I was having a lot of experiences right. that reminded yeah. me of the fall of 2007. Right. And we felt the bulk of the 2008 recession in the fall of, for us the, the, right. the, the, the most painful moment of the 2008 recession if I remember correctly was in the fall of 2007. Right. And um, by sometime in 2008 we had switched from the F yes purchase to the F it purchase. <laughs> yeah. Right. Which is the F the, the recession purchase. The F I'm, yes purchase was at that time was, Hey, I just got out of college and I just got a job selling mortgages, making 150 grand a year. What's the most expensive bike in here? Yeah. And more recently that was whatever, I've, I'm cash rich for whatever reason, right. and I and I have, have time, time to ride a bike, and I want to buy. Blah, 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 yeah. So that was, yeah. um, and then in the fall of 2007, it switched from that to, I just got laid off. Can I get a refund on my deposit? Mm, right. And we had some of that this fall wow. too. Not so much they got laid off, but the like mm. thing. I feel the 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 excuses were more nebulous this time, and I think a lot of it was my crypto tanked. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, right. I thought I, I thought I was a hundred thousand air in crypto and I'm not. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, um, but it's, but lately I've been hearing a, a really good customer, like kind of a friend from coming in so long and so often came in the other day. He was looking at a shuttle LT that the full bang in $12,000 one, one of the few bikes right. in the store, not on sale. Right. Right. <clears throat> And test rides, he's thinking about it. He looks at me, he's like, you know, I've been really scraping up to try to buy a third rental house this year. I've bought one each year the last two years. He's like, F it, I'm just going to get a bike. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's more right. where, you know. <laughs> F it, I'm just going to get a bike. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm glad that wasn't like a spend really scraping for my kids' education. Yeah, <laughs> no. Scared. I'm kidding. And right. and you know what? That's more the F yes purchases that are the irresponsible ones usually. Right. Usually the F it ones really are the like, 
I have a pretty big chunk of money that I was going to do something kind of special with. Right. And instead, I'm going to take a small part of that money yeah. and buy a really nice bike right. and play it safe. Right, right. And those are the type of people who <clears throat> it's not irresponsible what they're doing. No. Because they had their, they were, they were putting it aside to do like whatever long term investment or some sort of like leveraging of money to greater things. Or, or in some cases, it was take the family. I mean, seriously, some of some of these um, F, effort purchases. Right. The alternative bigger purchase was buy a new plane, buy a boat, take right. the family to Europe. Right. Like. Right. Right. So. Yeah, that's so. A, if you were going to spend thirty grand taking the family to Europe, and you were going to be okay with that, right. and then you're like, ah, F, that, I don't know yeah, if I it. can really do that. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to buy. I know. <laughs> we're all going to go riding, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, oh, I, and from from the bike shop's perspective, my thinking is that we keep we keep. A good chunk of the COVID riders still ride sometimes. Mm -hmm. a, a smaller, a large minority of them, or a, a, an impactful minority of them, between maybe five and twenty-five percent, still ride a lot. Got it. Yeah. Right. Right. Some large majority of them don't ride anymore. Right. Maybe twenty-five to fifty percent, like maybe just don't ride anymore. Sure. And for a shop like the Path, I think the bigger question is or a big question is what about our customers who are our customers before the pandemic who had more time to ride during the pandemic and maybe had a little extra cash flow during the pandemic, mm. even if it was just because they weren't spending gas money getting to the right. office sure. or whatever. A lot right. of people got, I know they didn't go eat. They didn't go out to eat as much. They didn't get their morning Starbucks. They didn't do these little, got things. a small check from the government. Right. Uh, maybe their business is doing well and they got a bonus. Right. Like, yeah. yeah, totally. Yeah, man, that's, um, yeah, I appreciate, always appreciate the business insight, uh, and savvy that you, that you bring. Oh man, thanks. I don't know if I were, I'm worthy of that, but thanks. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. I, what I will say is it's the answers to those types of questions are always so nuanced, right? Yeah. And if you can start get trying to figure out where the nuance lies, I think yeah, it's tricky. I think you've put yourself in a um, my uh, my observation has been over the past many years you've worked to a point where you, as a business owner, now you can spend a little bit more time thinking about those and thinking about those insights, thinking about those nuances. Yeah, and not stay up all night doing it. Right. Do it during the day, during business Correct. hours. Because at first, a lot of times I couldn't sleep because I was trying to do the mental work of having a, a roadmap for the business and everything at night because right. you can't do that while you're participating right. during the day. And, the, and a big part of the path survival was me teaching myself to turn that off and go to sleep too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Oh, uh, that's great. Um, hey, can I give a shout out? Please. All right. Shout out to Jesse uh, from the shop uh, for solving my intermittent battery power off problem on my giant fast road. It's an e-bike. And I had read about this before I bought the bike that people were, people were saying that these fast roads, for whatever reason, were intermittently shutting off like just powering down in the middle of a ride. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, a lot of different bike shops, they'd take it in, couldn't figure it out. And, you know, it's a whole drama thing and what have you. Well, I've had mine for about, I don't know, nine months, 10 months maybe, and got a lot of miles on it. And I'm like, huh, that's funny. I've never had this happen. And lo and behold, I was riding work one day and bike just powered off. And so it just started happening so I, I brought it in and, and, you know, dropped it off. And thanks to the path and, and Jesse for looking at it. Um, he kind of shimmed the battery, tightened it up a little bit, you know, cleaned the, 
clean the battery contacts, you know, um, make sure that the, so what that's talking about is in the battery compartment, just making sure that the battery is nice in there, nice and tight. Um, cleaning the battery contacts, it's probably been nine months or so, uh, making sure that all the firmware and everything is, is set up and, uh, and everything works like a charm. So th- awesome. Thanks to Jesse. I learned a new word too. What's that? Hooned. <laughs> Hooned. <laughs> <laughs> I like when adversity in life leads to me <laughs> learning a new word, and sometimes I can measure the level of adversity by how many new words I have to learn. <laughs> <laughs> but this is more of a fun new word. It is. It is. Hooned is like. R- so I actually Googled this, and. Um, you know, he's like, hey, Ock, I, 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 what does he say? I actually wrote it down. Hooned it around. Like, he, he wrote it like a hooligan. Right. It almost feels like maybe you shouldn't be saying it. I know. I, I shouldn't. I just, no, like, I mean, I, I think, it's, I think it's okay. It's okay? No, I, I, I shouldn't think be so. saying I it. I mean, but I love the fact that I learned it. It feels a little <laughs> naughty, but I don't think it actually is naughty. Uh, maybe. Okay. That is true. Uh, wrote it like a hooligan. It's Australian, New Zealand slang. Yeah, and I don't know enough about Australian and New Zealand slang to know true, if that's so. like yeah, hurting, so. really hurting someone's feelings who deserves better or anything. Yeah, that is true. Okay, but I don't I, think I so. I'm From what I know, yeah. this is one of those words that just kind of sounds like yeah, it might be, yeah, but I, isn't. I don't think it is. I, I offensive that is, or yeah. a slur of some kind. Yeah, I I did Google it. I think it's okay. I think it's okay. It's okay. I shouldn't personally be saying it because there's no way that coming out of my mouth it's like, you know, it's like a dad thing. I don't know, like. Oh, you think it's, it's yeah, not maybe like, th- like I don't know. <laughs> Certain words I try to I try to say in a younger with the younger generation, and they like kind of giggle, <laughs> pat me on the head. Okay, me, boomer. Okay, okay, boomer. Right. So <laughs> and you're like, I'm not a baby boomer, and there's like, baby. <laughs> um. Anyways, yeah. So the the e bike's been riding super well. Uh, That's awesome. Jesse is absolutely the man. I, one of the things I love the most about this job is all the cool people I get to work with and be, and get to know. And Jesse is a great example. I totally agree. Such a good energy, such a kind guy, and su- such a great contributor to the shop. And like has survived, you know, he, he's definitely had some adversity with his health that's like a little over the top and yeah. like so brave. Yeah. Like, yeah. <clears throat> um, critical thinker as well. Yeah. Uh, in his approach to work. Uh, as a as a bike mechanic, we've talked about the the skills required, but that critical thinking, uh, and and kind of understanding and and hear listening to what what you're saying, uh, and then like applying that to to the bikes is is awesome. Toolbox Wars champion. Yeah, that is right. I actually asked him if he'd come on the show, and he said he'd think about it. Wow, I could appreciate that. Yeah, we, I mean, since we are videoing, we could showcase the toolbox. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think he helped. Didn't he help um, with some of the uh, optimizations and the tool storage in the shop? Hundred percent. And also, Jesse has a lot of his own tools, which then leads to us realizing we should invest in those tools. Mm, so he's right. kind of a tool leader, right? He, uh, Jesse also does a lot for the shop in terms of kind of pioneering pioneering new services or, or doing servicing a new product that we haven't serviced before and learning the ins and outs of it right. first. Right. That kind of thing. Yeah, hopefully we get him on. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah. I did have a moment of pride, you know, like proud moment. I might just so I bought uh you know, um one of those it's like a tool um uh, what you can call it, like workstation with wheels got nice storage and kind of wood top the whole thing so i I bought that from my garage i redid everything drawers with bearings drawers with bearings like like super nice um and uh when you guys are redoing some of the stuff in the shop very similar very similar spec i was like oh my gosh i can't believe i picked that (laughs) <laughs> nice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> hey, Love it. Yeah, it was good. Cool. I think that might be a show. We got more stuff to talk about, but we could save it. I think so. I think that's a show. All right. Thanks, Hawk. Thanks, Jake. Thanks to all the listeners and all the bike brands. And huge thanks to the Path staff. 
let's all remember to love the bike we ride.